So we finally did it. We got on board one of the Idris M capital ships that the developers have been spawning for the event over the weekend, and it was not easy to get on board. I didn't even see the mission over the weekend after spending the entire weekend looking for it. And I certainly wasn't the only one who was experiencing this. I know people who have been looking the entire weekend as well, spending as much as 40 hours hopping servers only to never even see the Idris spawn. Thankfully though, we got a bit lucky because there was this org called the Outriders that I had met at a bar citizen last year who still knew about me and contacted me that they had found it on their server and invited me to chase it alongside them. They had already been chasing it for three hours and we added two hours to that clock since we joined. The guy who had it, we think his name was Big Bird 80 may have been running for as long as 10 hours with nobody on the server able to interdict him. Finally though, somebody on board apparently betrayed Big Bird and stopped the ship to let us board, coming into my chat to let me know that he was going to stop somewhere to let us jump to him. In retrospect, this was all a bit suspect, but I'm going to go over that and my thoughts on the event at the end of the video after I give you guys a tour, because I'm sure many of you guys were just hoping to see the interior of this long-awaited capital ship, but like so many, just never got lucky enough to see it pop up in their server. Quick disclaimer though, the quality of the cinematography in this video is not going to be quite up to the same level as I typically shoot because I just didn't have enough time with it, and I also didn't know the layout of the ship so organizing the way I toured it was kind of difficult so I cut together the footage as best as possible to make it clear for you guys. And we begin our tour here inside the hangar bay, which is actually only meant to hold two to three gladiuses, but there was a bunch of ships shoved in here because well, that's how it was boarded throughout the duration of its life since it was likely originally held by developers. The hangar bay is absolutely huge, spanning at least two decks high with space for cargo on the side, including a cargo lift that I'll show you later that appears on both sides of the ship. Aside from the cargo lift, access is gained through these side ramps to a hallway passage that leads you to a stairway that'll bring you up to the main B deck. Here you'll find a series of lockers, windows that look to the outside world, and a space big enough to bring additional cargo in and out of the hangar bay. The ship is incredibly spacious and you'll see that throughout the tour. Accessing the lowermost deck though is kind of strange, you gotta go down this ladder that's accessed through this hallway which brings you down to the lower turret access, there are two turrets on the belly of the ship, both in size 4, and this is also where you get to the Argo cargo hangar. Strangely though, there's no access here for cargo to be hauled up to the upper deck, so it would appear that you would need to unload the cargo into the hangar bay and then park the Argo cargo below, which feels a little bit strange. Also strange though is the access to the gravitational drive, which is a really cool room to check out when the ship is stationary. When the ship is in flight though, there's a door that actually closes over this device. It all feels a bit like Event Horizon, so <laughs> it's a little bit creepy maybe? But yeah, it's a bit of a strange layout, this is all that's accessible on this lower deck. To get back up, we go back up the ladder, which again is the only way to access this part of the ship, and then we can go up the stairs, which depending on which side of the ship you're on will lead up to one of two spaces. If you go up the port side stairway, it will lead you into the ship's gym and observatory towards the hangar, a place to hang out and work out to keep fit if you're part of the crew of the Idris. It's a really big space that has its own treadmill and weightlifting equipment, it's pretty neat looking. The starboard side of the ship leads you to what I think might be called flight operations. This is where in the campaign you'll be outfitting your ship and communicating with the deck crew about when you're going to leave and what you need done. It also has a really excellent view down onto the hangar deck. Up one more flight of stairs will finally bring us to the main deck called B Deck, and that's where the majority of the ship's program is accessed. Specifically on the top of the port side though it looks like this is where you'll access sim pods which was an interesting little discovery and a throwback to when we used to have sim pods in our hangars a long long time ago to access arena commander. But finally we're stepping out now onto the main deck. And first impressions of this space is that it's absolutely huge, although the long hallway actually meanders a bit in a way that I think is quite strategic to prevent people from shooting down the entire length of the ship in the event that it's been boarded. Like I said, I had no particular objective on where I was going just yet, I didn't know the layout, so I just started exploring and the first place I ended up going was 
aft where I ended up in the ship's brig, which is in plan in the aft port side wing of the ship. The space was lit very dramatically and felt a bit harsh, and I think that's quite appropriate. It is, after all, a place to imprison people. Although I don't think that in terms of gameplay you're ever going to be able to imprison a player fully against their will. I suspect there will be some kind of way to get out of that if you're the player, probably by just respawning if you want. The end of the hallway also has a security room where I imagine you can monitor the cellmates, which is pretty neat. And then on the very opposite side of the ship, in the other wing, you'll find the ship's armory. Here there's a shooting range, which is really cool. There's a long window that runs the length of the shooting range. You can see people doing their practice. And there's an office for the supply sergeant and his staff just adjacent to the actual armory room where you can get issued weapons to go out on mission. I actually think this is going to be something used quite a lot in Squadron 42, where you're going to be able to go and upgrade and check out new weapons as you progress through the campaign. But next, we're going to go down the hallway just behind both of these locations to check out the escape pods, which then leads back out onto the main B-deck hallway. One of the cool things I discovered exploring the ship is that there's also a lot of these EVA rooms with EVA suit lockers. I suspect that this is meant for maintaining the ship, so I look forward to seeing how those work. They didn't actually work, so I can't show you those operating in this video. But if you move to the aftmost part of B-Deck, you'll find the briefing room, which you may have seen if you've watched some of the Squadron 42 previews. This room is the space I suspect you'll be going to every time before you go out on mission to get briefed on what's going to happen in that mission, what the mission objectives are, and where you'll meet with a lot of the crew and the members of the main cast. But when this gets in our hands, I think it's going to be a lot of fun here to just give people briefings for operations you want to do with your org. Back out into the hallway though, we're going to start moving forward in this ship where once again, I was reminded of just how massive this ship is and how many crew members you can have on board and still feel like you're kind of alone. Ignoring of course the obnoxious AR markers for the rest of the party. Forward a bit on the deck though, we arrive at the elevator which will actually take us up to the bridge. This is one of two ways to access this. And we're not going to go up there just yet. I want to give you guys a full tour of this deck before we go up. So the next stop on this deck is going to be the reactor room. Ignore the flashing lights. This was a bit later in the recording when I finally found where this area was when we were being attacked by players and getting rammed. Here though is where you'll find the ship's two main reactors with a connecting decontamination room. Which fits a bit with the look that they were going for. It feels a lot like these reactors are meant to resemble modern day nuclear reactors. Though we don't know what actually powers this thing. The space though is appropriately cool looking. Sadly though, none of the access points are currently working. So there's no way for me to tell you what you can do in here. I think that this is being hidden from us because we're going to have to wait till we see it in the single player campaign. A bit more forward on the ship's B-deck though, we'll find the cargo deck. Now this was a bit unexpected to find. I didn't know that the cargo deck on B-deck was so big, but it just adds a lot more space to store stuff in addition to what's available on the sides of the hangar. You can access the hangar itself though via one of the two cargo lifts on either side of this cargo room. I imagine that this space along with the cargo on the sides of the hangar are going to become much more important as we move towards a more physicalized version of Star Citizen where unloading and loading things like missiles and ammo are going to become a lot more physicalized. So we're going to be using these spaces a lot more frequently. But let's get back to the main B deck because we're not done with the tour. There's a lot more to see. Our next stop is to the cruise mess hall. This space is also appropriately spectacular. It's located pretty much dead center of the ship. And what I really love about the mess hall is that it has these skylights that look out above where you sit down to eat. I love that the ship has so many windows looking outside because it always reminds you where you are in space, like if you're above a planet or something. Adjacent to the crew's mess is a crew locker room and shower room, which makes sense. As part of a crew's daily activity, after they grab breakfast, they'll probably wash up before they start their next shift. And being a military ship, this space is shared between the entire enlisted crew, plus some of the lower level officers. Through the back of this room though, we'll gain access to a hallway that gets us to the captain's quarters alongside the XO's quarters. Unfortunately, both of these rooms were locked and inaccessible, so I can't give you guys any cool tours of these spaces just yet. 
One thing I found a bit strange though is that the access route to these spaces feels a bit dark and industrial compared to the other hallways, so it felt a bit unceremonious and its location relative to the bridge seems kind of far away. But I'm not a naval architect, so I don't know, maybe this is fine. On the other side of the mess hall is the standard crew quarters for the regular enlisted crew who all get their own personal bunks with roll down doors, though those don't work in this current version of the Idris. On the port side of this space, you'll find access to the ship's head for just the enlisted crew. Strangely is though that there's no access to this room outside of the bunk bed area, so you'll have to pass through the sleeping quarters in order to use it, which again feels a bit strange. It seems like they could have added a door to the hallway, but I'm nitpicking here and this isn't really an architect reviews just yet. So. I'm just giving you guys my first impressions. On the other side of the same room though, is access to what looks to be a relaxation area connected to two officers rooms. While I never served with any branch of the military, I am familiar with the idea of keeping officers separate from the rest of the NCOs and enlisted members of the crew. Although that might be different for the Navy, so if you have served aboard a Navy vessel, let me know what you guys think of these spaces for crew members. And yeah, I know before you say it, it's pretty spacious for a Navy vessel. I've been aboard a few of them, so I'm familiar with how cramped they can feel. But yeah, you know, this is the future. Maybe, maybe they were cool with being just a bit more luxurious for the crew. Well, let's continue the tour. Moving again forward on the ship, we'll momentarily pass by one of the two docking collars for the ship on the starboard side. And then we'll also pass yet another one of those EVA rooms I told you guys about. More forward on the ship, we find then the missile room, which is unfortunately inaccessible and even blanked out on the map that I was able to find online, so we have no idea what this room looks like, but right next to it is a space that we can visit, and that's the ship's med bay. And it is actually called a med bay, according to this map, not a sick bay. The med bay, if my information is not too out of date, is actually pretty big for a capital ship of this class, with a series of tier 3 med beds and one tier 1 med bed just across the hallway. So in terms of gameplay, you'll be able to respawn here if you die once this gets in the game. It's also got its own chief medical officer's office just across from both of these med rooms. But now let's take a look at the forwardmost section of B-Deck. A short walk down the hallway through yet another bulkhead, we'll find ourselves in the escape pod room for the forward section of the ship, located here on the ship's map, and it's here that you'll gain access to the ship's largest turret, which I believe has size 7 weapons, just on the nose above the forward hangar doors. Backtracking a bit though, there are a couple of cross-connecting hallways which dip down a little bit below B-Deck, which are pretty cool. They have these windows that look out onto the hangar below. There's two of them, so you can actually get across the ship a little bit more easily instead of going all the way around the reflected plan, and it offers some pretty spectacular views out onto launching ships. But we had a ton of crap inside of the hangar for this run, so unfortunately I can't show you ships flying in and we're definitely going to do some flight operations in the future when we actually get this in the game for real. Now though, it's time for us to move up yet another deck to an interstitial deck out on the wings of either side of the ship. This is one of the access routes to get to the bridge, but on this interstitial deck we'll find access to two of the ship's larger turrets. Both of them feature size 5 weapons, and if you know about Star Citizen's balance, you may know that size 5s are more targeted towards dealing with medium to large sized vessels. So if you've been paying attention, you may then realize that the Idris actually only has two turrets on its belly that are capable of dealing with light fighters. This leads me to the conclusion that the ship is probably mostly meant to defend itself, utilizing its complement of fighters in its hangar bay. Leaving these larger turrets to deal with larger vessels should they get close enough to come in contact with it more directly. But I guess we'll just have to wait until the new flight model comes out and until we get this in the game. Now though, it's time to tour the final space aboard the ship that you've not seen yet. Through one of two hallways on either the port or starboard side, you can gain direct access to the ship's bridge. But as I said earlier, there's another way to access it and that's via this elevator which brings you up from B-Deck. One of the cool things that I didn't expect though is that this is actually a double sided elevator with the back side of the elevator leading to what looks to be an emergency airlock exit for the bridge crew. Although there are no escape pods here so if they needed to exit in an emergency, I'm not quite sure how they'd live. Uh, it's kind of a weird design. 
But the bridge itself is absolutely spectacular. There's this lower area with four engineering councils that leads up to the main bridge area where the captain and the rest of the main deck officers sit. In the center of the space, there's also this display globe that's going to have 3D holographic displays of the area around you with ships and any other points of interest you might want to see. Unfortunately though, it doesn't really function in this version of the game. That stuff is coming in the next patch, 323, so we're just gonna have to wait until then to see how it actually looks and rely on the videos that they've shown us of Squadron to really see how it's meant to be. And of course, the best seat in the house is the captain's chair, dead center, and it has such a good view through this canopy. You know, this isn't an architect reviews really, but I just gotta say, the bridge on this ship is easily the best one we have in the game to date. It's the most like a bridge that I've always wanted to see in Star Citizen, the kind of bridge that feels very much like the bridges we've seen in Star Trek. And it does feel pretty epic to be at the helm of a ship that has a size 10 railgun capable of one-shotting pretty much everything currently in the game. Which is ultimately why the Idris M is so special, and why so many people want it, and why CIG stopped selling it many years ago, at least directly. You can still technically buy it if you buy one of the massive ship packs for $15,000 or $48,000, but most people aren't buying that. The only way to buy an Idris nowadays is to buy it on the gray market or to get the civilian variant called the Idris P or the Idris K, which is technically the Idris P with an upgrade package. But even those are incredibly expensive, selling for 1,500 US dollars and sell out in literally minutes whenever they go on sale, regardless of when they go on sale. It's actually kind of insane. And so the desirability of this ship is extremely high, which is great context to understand the latter part of this video. So the Idris M event that they ran over this past weekend could have been done a lot better. The idea behind winning a really rare ship like the Idris M is a pretty cool one. It's just that the way that it was done was probably not the best way to do an event. To recap, the event went like this. There are two ways to win the Idris M. The first way is to capture an Idris M spawned by developers as part of the event in game, with the winner being the one to hold the Idris the longest while being in the pilot seat and while being in combat. That latter part of the rule was added a little bit later after players were cheesing it by going way above the orbital plane of the star system where nobody could actually quantum to them to get a hold of the ship, which was a bit unfair for everybody else involved. With the other way to win it being that you need to submit a video, I think around 10 seconds long, which would be judged by CIG, for which they found the most fun and entertaining. And so in the end, only two Idris M's were to be given, or are to be given away at the time of the making of this video. We don't know who won them just yet. Now, the way I see it, the nature of this contest required a big org in order to capture the event, which already excludes individuals from getting the ship, which I kind of get because it ultimately is a multi-crew ship. But the issue is that only one person out of that group is ever going to be able to win it and sit in that seat. And so it already creates internal conflict in a game that doesn't have any way to create co-ownership between different members of an org. In fact, there are no org tools even in Star Citizen at the moment. So this then by nature is going to create friction internally for any org who gets a hold of it. I think this part may have been diffused a little bit by offering secondary rewards for anybody involved as part of that org that wins the event. Maybe free sets of armor or like a small ship or a dragonfly like what they do with the referral program. Yet another problem though that we found was actually getting a hold of the address. Ships like the Mantis are terribly inadequate for catching things in Quantum like what it's meant to really do. There's no real good way to stop somebody in Quantum if they're jumping around in the middle of space. The Mantis unfortunately is woefully inadequate with its measly 20 kilometer radius capability of stopping somebody. Just making it a rule that you needed to be in combat in order to count the time in the seat probably wasn't enough of a stopgap measure. They probably should have severely limited the quantum fuel of that ship to give more people a chance to catch up with it. But probably the worst problem with the event was just the rarity of the event in general. 
As I said at the start of the video, there were people who spent as many as 40 hours looking for this thing never to even see it once, and I suspect this is very much to do with the fact that the developers were spawning this manually and during the UK and possibly US time zones. And while I personally didn't search for it for 40 hours, I searched for it all my stream on Saturday with no success, all of Sunday off stream, only to get lucky on Monday with somebody else already having found the mission and inviting me in to check it out. If I wasn't invited and I didn't know about it, I never would have seen it. And so while I agree the Idris M event should have been rare, if it's advertised as an event to the entire community, it should not have been this rare. In my view, they shouldn't have run the event if they couldn't automate it in some fashion to spawn much more often so that more people could have enjoyed the experience of trying to get on board. This wouldn't have altered the event very much, I mean you could have just given away one anyway, because ultimately it's about holding it the longest. But if it's an event you're advertising to a large community, I think that the larger community should have a chance at it and not just a random very, very lucky few. Because that rarity created even more unnecessary toxicity, with angry people just ramming the ship because they didn't want anybody to win the event. And this ramming was happening pretty much every single time the thing was caught. I really think that if the Idris spawn was a lot more common that this wouldn't have been happening as often. In addition to this, they probably should have just docked one of these things at one of the spaceports to give the people who just wanted to see the interior a chance to walk around. I mean, not everybody is part of a big org and I think this is another part of the anger towards this event. Now to address me personally getting aboard this ship, we very much suspect in retrospect that the guy who handed this ship to us may have been hacking, but we have no proof of this and so I can't really outright accuse him of doing so, so I'm just gonna leave that for you guys to speculate on. I did mention this to Xylo though, who I'm sure is part of the team judging who wins so that they can take that into account. If it turns out that that's the case, that's really, really unfortunate. Hacking or not though, I personally won't have a chance at winning it because I never sat in the pilot seat. That really wasn't my objective, and I was along as a guest. I wasn't leading the org. I wasn't even in the same discord as the people who were chasing it, so I thought it best to leave the Idris to them and let them make their own decisions. Thankfully, they were jumping around, trying to get their own org on board before they started fighting, which gave me plenty of time to look around the ship in the end. So special thanks to the Outriders organization for letting me tag along and I hope that you guys got enough time in the seat to count towards something. I did hear though later on that the ship was sadly taken back by who the Outriders suspect may have been yet another hacker. Possibly even the same dude that gave us the ship in the first place. But yeah, in the end this event turned out to be quite a bit of a mess. Though I'm sure some of you guys did have fun and for those of you who did, I'm happy for you. Let me know how your experiences were down below if you had a good time and if you had a similar time to me where you were mostly searching never to find it, also let me know down below. But hopefully we get a better future event and hopefully the Idris returns at Invictus for us to all get a full look in person ourselves. That's it for now, hope to see you guys in the next one.